Hello, Kevin. Hello, Trisha. Hello. Hello, welcome Hello. to Tokyo. How was your day so far? Uh, I don't know. It was a day. It was fine. <laughs> well, <laughs> my, my day's been good. I'm actually in the same time zone as you, although a little bit north of Romania. Um, so uh, I'm at the Build Stuff conference. Um, oh, cool. So I'm actually somewhere that's not home. So this is unusual. Um, so yeah, my day has been filled with some really good talks. Um, and yeah, so we're going to continue in the same exactly. manner. Well, we're going to spoil that now. You know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So once again, everyone, welcome at Code Camp. Uh, I, I think it's just about time to thank our partners. Our partners, today. Mumble. They're the ones that uh, make this possible. So thank you guys very much for your support and hope you enjoy the day as much as we do. And thank you to all of our attendees or participants. Uh, I think we have over 500 people registered. Let's see what's the aftermath after the talk. I, I feel like people are going to join. I mean, we're already seeing people joining and joining. Um, we're going to also have, I don't know, a lot of conversation, maybe some questions that chat and then everything. So uh, I think we should kick it off, right? We should. Maybe one thing worth mentioning is that uh, on our uh, apps, either web or mobile, we have some uh, game section where if you, uh, I don't know, check out the booth uh, of our partners. And uh, I think they also have a quiz. If you ask questions in the, in the chat, you can redeem some points. And the first, uh, let's say, five people in the leaderboard, they will receive uh, free invitations to our CodeCamp Festival next year in person. Fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. So 97 is a big magic number. Are we going to tackle all the topics that, that, that uh, Kevin and Trisha uh, managed to put together uh, as a community effort, if I understand it right, in the book or how should we? Well, first of all, I want to say, I think, the book is a testimony of the fact that things get more complex over time. So I when I started out, uh, people wiser than uh, me told me that uh, yeah, you should uh, pay attention to two things, naming convention, caching validation, and off by one errors. Yeah. Now there's like <laughs> seven things I should pay attention to. Exactly, exactly. And probably more than that. But to answer your question, uh, yeah, I think there are a lot of things to cover and it's a really, really interesting book. So I like also, I like every topic, but I also like the fact that you can always read parts of it, then come back, uh, then read something else or reread the ones that uh, you liked. And then you get flashbacks of the projects you had and uh, what happened. So it's really, really nice. In this respect, the one particular thing that I really like about this book is that I can open it wherever I want to open it. I mean, yeah, okay. And, and, and I, I'll just get some perspective on some some of the engineering, all of the uh, hot engineering topics, or some are hot, some are all these but goals. I mean, all sorts of very good, good things. But this is one thing that I particularly like about the book. So we prepared some topics that we want to, let's say, tackle together with Kevin and Trisha. I do admit that uh, most of them uh, are written by past uh, CodeCamp speakers. So we're, we're biased. biased, but I think we all of us are since the first thing in the book is all you need is Java, right? <laughs> yeah, start, starting with the, the Beatles, right? All you need is love. Okay, and then now it's Java. And I have to admit that initially I thought that, yeah, what, what's behind the title? You, you always think about, you know, what's behind the title. And I thought, yeah, what's behind the title, by the way? And then I'll share my, my first impression on what's behind the title. Okay. okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one because it, kind of I was there at the origin story, which happened, you know, in a, in a land far, far away from now, you know, in the first, in the 2000s, it wasn't even 2010. Um, and uh, Bruce Eckel, who wrote Thinking in Java, um, and a number of other things, but notably in this context, Thinking in Java, he ran this kind of private list for various people. Um, and we used to just have discussions. And one of them uh, was a question from Richard Monson Hayfall, who asked, he said, what are the things a software architect should know? You know, he says, because I put this talk in, 10 things every software architect should know. 
and now I need 10 things. So what are your suggestions, people? And he got a lot more than 10. And he said, you know, this is really interesting. We could actually make a book from this. I know somebody at O'Reilly, um, you know, and, but we need a bigger number, not 10. And he said about 100, but 100 is too obvious. And 101 and 99 are trying too hard not to be 100. They're a bit too obvious. And he said 97. That's kind of got a nice feel to it. Um, and it does. So 97, because it's not quite 100, but it feels like 100. And so Richard kind of set that. The first book was 97 Things Every Software Architect Should Know. Then we had a series of books. I um, edited 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know. And there was kind of a long period of silence. And then we kind of kicked, kind of this was one of the books that kind of helped O'Reilly kick the next wave off. Um, and we thought, let's get language specific. Um, and 97 Things Every Java Program Should Know. But the whole series is called 97 Things. So you can't have 99 things. You can't have 100 things, which is a problem, because as you said, there are more things that we want to know with time. And one of the challenges that Trisha and I had was we got a, we got a lot more than 97 things <laughs> and it was cutting it down. So that that was the challenge. There are many more than 97 things. But yeah, um, the fact there is a new book, maybe, I don't know, in the near future or the other 97 things, the other 90 and the other 97, yeah, 97 more, 97 more so. things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So especially life goes with, on, on series of 97. <laughs> especially with Java coming out every six months now, it's kind of, it's going to be very easy to hit another 97 things to know about Java. Right. How about the first, the first topic that you tackled? All you need is Java. So my impression was, well, this is in a way, I, I, I don't, didn't even uh, know how to think about it. All you need is Java. It's, it's maybe it's a bit too much. Especially mm -hmm. being a .NET developer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all you need is Java. All you need is love. Okay, I know this thing. I thought it's may maybe like, you know, but then I got it. I got it in, uh, you know, not in the sense that the author of, of this uh, uh, tiny chapter was thinking about it, but I got it in the sense that, well, all you need is Java. But in the meantime, there is a plethora of, of other, you know, languages which are evolving I don't know, maybe it's Mesh and Python or, or others. And all those languages are learning from each other because they are targeting various needs. And then you see all sorts of features which are part of a language then you know, being implemented in another one. And I thought that this title will then reveal the, you know, the interaction between the communities and then the languages and what's happening in the industry. But actually, behind the title, there is a much simpler, you know, and very uh, straightforward uh, Java related thing, right? Yeah, yeah. for sure. I, I thought this was an interesting, uh, interesting one, actually, because so in this particular one, it was it, if the it was trying to get us to think beyond or even less than all the libraries and frameworks and all the rest of it, like that we can actually do quite a lot with with the Java libraries that come that come with just the JDK. And I thought that was really interesting actually, because a couple of years ago when Java 9 came out, I tried to create a microservices framework, a microservices application with just the JDK and no frameworks, no libraries, no nothing like that. And, um, and, and I did manage to do that with just the JDK. I don't recommend it because you have to hand grow an awful lot of stuff, which other people have done. But there's a there's a lot of stuff in just Java, which is gives it a lot of power and a lot of flexibility. Yeah. yeah that that. So, so Anders uh, Anders Norash wrote that piece, and it, that was the point. In fact, the piece was originally much longer. He was going to do loads and loads of code. He had a much bigger work example, but we have a kind of like a space constraint. You know, the ten pages was going to be too much. Um, uh, but that was it. Was exactly as Trisha says that the, there is. I think everybody. Um, particularly as languages grow, we see it's not unique to the Java space, but certainly Java, it, it, it's one of those places where you kind of, you draw in a bit and then you draw in everything. And there is the sense of like, people sometimes will start new, a new development by first of all, not even asking the question, what are we trying to build? They'll sit there and say, okay, what technology stack should we have? But what are we trying to build? Don't worry about that. Let's get the, what's the, you know, Let's add to the technology stack. In other words, they'll start with the technology stack and then say, and now what are we trying to build? In other words, they bring in a lot more complexity sometimes they need. And exactly uh, as Trisha says, you can pare it back. You can, you can, you'd be surprised what you can do. As you say, you don't necessarily recommend it for 
everything, but there is an idea there that there is more possible than you thought. Sometimes people reach too quickly for a dependency when actually they've already got it, either in the language or, or within the immediate realms of the JDK uh, libraries. And um, sometimes we forget what's there. There's already so much there. Um, it's very easy to just start off with, we'll import half the universe um, when you've actually already got a really valuable microcosm there. Right. <clears throat> Speaking of biases, so I've got two lucky numbers. First one is uh, 54. Sounds familiar? 54 in the book? <laughs> Trisha? <laughs> cognitive load? What is that thing, cognitive load? I've heard, I don't know. Um, so, so just to set the scene, I do work for JetBrains and I do, I am a developer advocate for IntelliJ IDEA. So I was like, how do I write something about how IDEs are amazing without being all marketing on IntelliJ IDEA specifically? So I was thinking about <clears throat> what is it? Why do I like using IntelliJ IDEA as my IDE versus coding in any other way? Because I have used other IDEs. I have coded using, you know, by and text editors and compilers and stuff. Um, so why is it that, that IntelliJ IDEA specifically helps me as a developer? And it's mostly because it stops me having to think about other stuff. Like I don't, it, the IDE reduces my cognitive load by, instead of me thinking, right, what does an if statement look like? How do I type that? You know, you just type, um, you type it or if or whatever in IntelliJ and just kind of fills out with live templates, it just writes half your code for you. And a lot of people argue that that's, well, that's lazy. Well, yes, but laziness is not necessarily a bad thing from a programmer's point of view. You want the tools to do the boring, easy, lazy stuff so that you are thinking, okay, like we were just saying, what is the business problem we're trying to solve? What is the thing we're actually trying to deliver? What is the thing we're trying to do? Instead of thinking, how do I write an if statement? How do I um, migrate this code from one thing to another? How do I extract a method? So instead of having to do any of these steps in a kind of um, sort of step-by-step -step thing, thinking about my lines of code, you just say to IntelliJ IDEA, oh, refactor this method and extract this thing and reshape it this way and run all my tests so that I can prove everything works, check it in, and away I go, trying to think about the next thing that I want to do. So yes, by all means, think of IDEs as something which are going to make things, make us lazier, but that just frees up our mind to be thinking about stuff which is more valuable for the business. What's your favorite IDE then? Well, it still remains Visual Studio. I don't code. Have to code, right? <laughs> I use both. Uh, I like them both. <laughs> Really, they, they, they provide me like, I mean, they, they release the cognitive load <laughs> from time to time, not always, you know, because yeah. Okay. I mean, there is, there is a cost to it because it, in order to reduce your cognitive load, you have to invest time to begin with to, to learn these tools. And that's why sometimes it's difficult to switch from tool to tool. So that, and sometimes it's, it's difficult. If you're going to be switching languages, for example, you might not have the time or you might not feel like it's worth the time investment to learn the specifics of one tool for one language for one small project. So everything is everything has costs and benefits, right? Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of this, you know, learning curve and the time you need to, to invest and the discipline that you need to, you know, I mean, even the posture, you know, in front of the keyboard sometimes is very important. And I, I was jealous of on colleagues that, you know, they were so handy with all the shortcuts and everything. And they were looking at my eyes while, while you know, uh, writing some snippets and, and how is this even possible? It's, uh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, they, 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 they must have been using like a very friendly IDE, I would say, but discipline and, and the, the investment in, in doing all that upfront, <clears throat> I think that that cannot be just, you know, yeah, I think Trisha is absolutely right. Uh, so you need to invest a lot first and you can extrapolate things even further. If you talk about, I don't know, let's say then boring infrastructure stuff or uh, connecting to a database, but then in order to use uh, other tools or frameworks that makes this easy and let you focus on, let's say, business logic, you need to understand what's, uh, how do they work and what's happening there in order not to mm -hmm. create more problems. Than, than and I, I can even make like a parallel. I don't know if it's the most suitable, but, but think of swimming, no swimming. You can swim if you, you know, if you just, you know, work hard, like, yeah, put a lot of energy, but if you learn how to swim, you know, how to breathe and how to move your body, it's much, much easier 
I mean, much easier. You, I mean, with, with the same with the same amount of energy, you do a lot more. That's the so, parallel like, in I'm my mind. I'm still struggling with that, but uh... <laughs> but you love sauna, <laughs> as far as I know. Yeah. So it's. Uh... <laughs> All right. So, what other number, favorite number, do you have? Let me think. Sixty-six. <laughs> Sixty-six. Uh, have we? I mean, do we have guts to discuss about the sixty-six and progress? Yeah, it, it's it's funny. You're always, you're pulling out the numbers. The funny thing is, in the printed book, we never had the numbers. We, we have them in the <laughs> we have them in the PDF, and uh, so you know, that's quite interesting. Yeah, sixty-six. Yeah, program with guts. This is my. <laughs> um, and guts is. Um, uh, is an abbreviation that uh, Alistair Coburn came up with a number of years ago, good unit tests. And what he's talking about is, I mean, these days we talk a lot about testing. We have done for a while. The conversation has increased. Um, I am fortunately or unfortunately old enough to remember when unit testing wasn't really a thing that developers did. I'm not saying that all developers now do it. I'm, I'm afraid, sadly, when I go out of the field that no testing is still the most popular testing technique. Um, but in terms of the number of developers and particularly where you find a group of uh, developers who are much more interested and focused on their craft um yeah testing is is there in some presence and some people are arguing oh do we do a tdd do we not and for me that's a slightly separate conversation one i'm very happy to have but sometimes people confuse the kind of discussion of like well i've got unit tests um that must be good automatically yeah it, it's a good i have tests and it's just like well no it, it's a bit like code just as you can have code that is you can have code that works against you you know you can have code with unmanaged technical debt uh, with lost knowledge and you're looking at it going i have no idea why this works or even if it works you can have the same experience with tests people sometimes forget that and we often treat tests as second class citizens so we don't we, we sort of oh that test it, it's for the build it's not for humans, it's for the build because it doesn't go into production. It's just like, well, yeah, but it's part of the pipeline and somebody has to maintain it. What makes a good unit test? And I've seen many cases where people have, they kind of, their heart is in the right place. But again, it goes back to this investment of technique um, as with anything is what is a good unit test? In other words, it, it gets us to ask a harder question. What does a good unit test look like? Or what would I be comfortable maintaining? What would I be comfortable coming back to later? If something failed, what would I expect to see? So that's what um, that piece um, answers. And I make it slightly more conversational, but it's just like, are you just trying to test that the code works or are you showing me what you mean by the phrase, it works? Because that's the hard thing. People don't, you know, let's say you joined a new project uh, tomorrow morning. You wouldn't walk in there and go, hey, does your code work? <laughs> um, maybe you would, maybe you've been forewarned about something, but normally your question is, what do you mean by it works? That's the hard bit. What does it actually mean? I mean, sure it goes green, but what does that actually mean? And that's the harder bit. So this idea that good unit tests have a strong role in communicating meaning, that they should be readable. Um, some of what makes a good unit test readable is not necessarily the same as what makes production code readable. It kind of has some of its own conventions, but there is an idea of good unit tests as opposed to not so good unit tests. And so therefore it's trying to raise the game of the industry a little bit. It's just like, okay, you've got unit tests, that's a good start, but what can we do to make them more pleasurable, you know, uh, you know as a developer? I quite often look at unit tests when I, if I'm looking at the code, especially new code, and I don't know what it does, <clears throat> I don't look at the tests just to tell me it works. I look at the test to, to sort of figure out the thought process of the developer, particularly if there's like, um, uh, like a, a logic thing where, you know, it's got a, a bunch of like if else's, I want to see some tests to go, okay, what are we checking for here? And why are we checking for it? Is it really likely that a user is going to input these sorts of things? Why should it fail under these circumstances? And I kind of expect the the test names and the way the tests have been set up to explain to me as a developer why those choices were made when the production code was written. But yeah, often that's... just get, if you've got something like you were saying in the in the article, if you've got something which says test one, you're like, okay, yeah. <laughs> what is that? Uh, yeah, and I've seen, I've seen those tests, test one, test two, test three, and it's just like, well, when test three fails, I mean, in fact, I did ask this, I asked the particular team, what does it mean when test three fails? And they kind of looked at each other and shrugged their shoulders. And I said, but also what does it mean when it passes? I right. Mean, we're stuck with the same question. We don't have, so there's this idea that testing is an act of communication. Um, and it's an act of explanation. Exactly as Tricia says, it, it, you're trying to get inside the, 
uh, it gives you the mental model and it tells you uh, a bit more of the why you're removed from the mechanism. It, it's a really good way of actually showing how well your code is encapsulated um, because you're having to, it, it also ties in with other disciplines like domain driven design and so on, because is there a name for this condition that we've now entered into? If so, that we should, that's probably part of the explanation that it's not just an if, it's actually a, a situation or oh, there's a business term for this situation. Is there one? Well, is that is that visible? So it's very much the idea that tests are um, an act of explanation, but unlike comments, they actually get executed. Um, so, so you know, you actually are moved if it turns if it goes from green in one build to red in another, you are moved to do something about it. Whereas comments just disappear into the ether. We did have a bunch of articles in there about comments as well, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in fact, that, that, that's an interesting point because we do have, this is kind of well, what do we mean by commenting or the rest of it. So, and some of this, I mean, it's worth pointing out that some of the advice there goes beyond, although it's 97 things every Java programmer should know. It's tar the Java program, Java programs are people using the AVM are the target, but actually a lot of this you will find is, is portable advice. It's advice you would use, you would, you could use anywhere. Yeah, looking at, this, uh, at some of the comments that we're seeing in the chat, so, well, people really get engaged, I would say. Uh, um, as a developer, I find mastering the IDE as mandatory, for instance, one of, one of the, the comments. Yeah, I see that one, yeah. I, I, I highly recommend, if you're using IntelliJ IDEA, you should go to the IntelliJ IDEA YouTube channel to find out about that. I've done a bunch of videos and serve my colleagues on, on how to master the IDE. Mm -hmm. What other interesting comments? Well, there is there is actually an interesting one uh, from Rezvan that I'm eager to get into the subject of uh, behavior is easy, state is hard. So I think that's a Let's good place that, to go mm -hmm. into next. Uh, and we have to kick it off. I have to say, when I read it, uh, it went me back to my college years where I think the teacher would ask you, okay, can you define OP? Uh, and then somebody started to say the actual definition and realized that that's just repeating the book and not uh, understanding what's going on. And then the teacher would say, look, you just need to define for me polymorphism and inheritance and encapsulation. And then I will see that uh, you get it. And that's the answer. And then when I started working well, as a junior in the first uh, year, I would see that Indeed, like uh, Edson were saying, was saying in the in the book that yeah, polymorphism and inheritance are pretty much used, but uh, encapsulation not so much. And you would uh, create an entity or a class, and the first thing you would do, you would uh, generate getters and setters. That was the first step for everything. Yeah, and, and that that's a, that's an interesting one because what what I like about this is there's that, there's lots of different definitions. Whenever we come to talk about paradigms, people normally have kind of like a hit list. And the funny thing is, I, with the polymorphism and inheritance and encapsulation, sometimes people list them in that order or, um, you know, inheritance comes at the top because it's a visible language mechanism. And I discovered a number of years ago when I started looking at code, but also how to teach it, is I actually have a slide where I put encapsulation, it, it, it's, in, it's in bold and it's big. Then a little bit weaker in a slightly dimmer font is polymorphism and then really dim is inheritance. Inheritance really isn't that important. In statically typed languages, it's a mechanism for achieving polymorphism. That's your main goal. Polymorphism is an extension of, in, of encapsulation. In other words, how do I get behavior from something without knowing what it is? That's polymorphism. It's also encapsulation. In other words, it extends it further. But the thing that I really like here is that he picks on another sort of dimension, another way of looking at things. And there's a, uh, a definition from Grady Booch, um, who in his like 30 years ago, um, his work on object oriented design, he said, yeah, an object is characterized by identity, state and behavior. And that for me is much more interesting. Um, who, who is the object? Who am I, as it were? Uh, and then state, what do I know? Behavior, what is the relationship of that? And this piece kind of gets closer to asking the question saying, actually some of the behaviors relatively easy, but we do, do we have a really good life cycle model of state? That's the bit that confuses people. In fact, my kids actually know about state machines, not because I've taught them, but because they've heard me swear about so many applications that have not modeled their state. This is like, how did this application get into this state? 
because probably the programmer envisaged it as, oh, I need a field with this, I need a field with that, I need a Boolean, another Boolean and a list, and I'm gonna put getters for all of them. And it's just like, well done, you've reinvented records, but you've made them harder. Uh, you know, it, you haven't really helped anybody. What's the model? What does this embody? What is the, what's the life cycle? You know, it, 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 there's this idea that state can move or sometimes it can't move. Sometimes that's a simplifying assumption. Edson also covers that. What is the relationship of state to time? Well, maybe it should be immutable. And that simplifies a whole load of things. But yeah, it's really, he wants us to get away from the getters and setters, which also picks up on another point relating back um, was response to um, uh, uh, what Trisha was talking about in terms of the IDEs. You need to know how to use your ID. Your IDEs are tools. They, they don't have a necessarily a strong opinion. They allow you to do all kinds of things. You are, you're in charge. So let yourself be in charge. And the problem is sometimes people say, I'm gonna just generate, auto-generate all the getters and setters. Your IDE will not come back and say, are you sure about that? It's, 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 it's gonna say, okay, you're the boss. And they do allow you to do that. It's just, that's not really where you wanna go. Yeah, one of the things I've been trying to explore recently, we were doing some, I was doing some live coding with them, um, with a bunch of colleagues. And one of the, when we started with our entities that were going to go into the database, particularly we were using like restaurant entities and like orders and things like that. And the first thing some people wanted to do was create a, a, a very stupid pojo and put all the fields on there and then generate getters and setters and away you go. And I was like, no, don't put the setters on there until you know you need to change the state. Why don't we go with immutable at, by default? If you have no reason to change the state of an object, don't give mechanisms for changing the state of that object until you know when and why that's going to happen. So for example, like once I've placed an order at a restaurant, generally speaking, if you're using one of these online ordering systems, you're not allowed to change that. Right, that's done, that's gone to the restaurant. You're getting noodles whether you wanted noodles or not, right? You shouldn't be creating setters where something can accidentally like override the, the order so that the order that the restaurant gets is different to the order that you sent. Like that's going to lead to all sorts of weird bugs. Right? That should never have happened. So yeah, by default, I, I like to teach people, especially when generating code with the IDE, don't generate the setters, do everything as immutable to begin with. Similar again, ties in a little bit to what we were talking about with the dependencies don't start with all your dependencies add each dependency as you need it start with the absolute minimum and then gradually build on top of it don't just go right i'm gonna have the whole of everything and the kitchen sink and then like just it's a free-for-all and we'll just kind of pick and choose everything that we want like because that just leads to this spaghetti tangled mess where nobody can reason about what's being used and how it's being used and in particular that idea of you know you need to as it were you need to justify why why does this method exist why you know it, it's true for all methods but when we get down to the getters and setters this really needs to be why are you setting this are you does that make sense what is the what is the case that requires that and is that case reasonable um and and you, in other words you need to make a a case quite literally a case for it uh, and it can be a test case so sometimes again this, this is one of the reasons i favor a test driven approach is because like show me the code that needed that setter well, I haven't written it yet. There you go, we can delete the setter and it doesn't break anything. And people are kind of shocked, it's, yeah, but it auto-generated. No, you, you you, need to change your IDE defaults. You need to change your finger defaults. You know, it's just like that's, being able to change state is, is should be considered um, a privilege, not a, not a right. You know, you, you need to make a case for it, but also how you move from one state to another. Um, you know, again, the restaurant order thing is, is really important. There's a life cycle to how the order gets submitted, how you pay for things. If you step outside that life cycle, you don't want a developer sitting there scratching their head saying, how do we get to this state? And somebody going, well, because this field is like this. No, you've given me an explanation in terms of the fields, but you haven't given me an explanation in terms of the business. Um, what's, your, what's, what's the life cycle model of this entity? Blank look. What's the state model of this entity? Blank look. It's like, that's why we have a problem. We shouldn't be here, but we didn't know that here was a place we couldn't be. So it's really that idea of trying to bring out the story of the code and your your object should participate in that. It shouldn't just say, I am all things to all people. Um, those are the worst kinds of objects. <laughs> so you, it could be anything, including very wrong. Yeah, good luck debugging that afterwards. Uh, yeah, exactly. You're very well, you know, in other words, you can deep, you can see what's wrong here, but you don't know why it got here. So that was caused by another piece of code, caused by another piece of code, caused by, and that's the problem. And that's the whole idea with encapsulation is that encapsulation, is about preventing things. It's not about allowing things. It's actually about saying of all the infinite possibilities, most of these don't make sense for this.
and that we're going to guide you down this path that makes sense for our application. And it goes exactly back to what Trisha was saying. Like it, when we're talking about the ID and your cognitive load, it lets you focus on what are we actually trying to build? We're probably not trying to build getters and setters. I don't think, you know, any customer, what I need is an application with lots of strings, lists, and a few integers, a couple of Booleans, and lots of getters and setters, please. That's not their request. They probably have something more specific in mind. Your job is to shape it and make it specific, specify. That's quite literally the same root uh, word. Yeah. Since you then mentioned college and um, you mentioned inheritance, I couldn't stop, you know, <laughs> I couldn't help stopping, I mean, smiling a little bit inside my head. When I remember how much time I invested to understand, you know, the, the very well-known diamond, the inheritance diamond with multiple inheritance with, with the virtual functions. And it was like crazy. Now I can't even remember why did we learn that, to be honest, because it was, it was like, <laughs> such a very cumbersome type of thing? It, I, it was of immense interest from a theoretical point of view and from a language design point of view, it is actually an interesting thing. But it's kind of an edge case. It's not really about, you know, it, it, people made it important by talking about it more. People kept saying, well, Diamond and Herod, and, and people dedicated sections of books, sections of courses that you people were taught. And they were, and it's just like, it's, and people walked away. Oh, right, this is really important. No, it isn't. <laughs> it absolutely isn't. That's not actually what object orientation is about. It's an interesting kind of case to discuss and then move on. Um, and that's the problem is we got distracted. And many people, when they learn object orientation, they got really drawn into inheritance. Uh, and the funny thing is, you talk to many people, in fact, if you go back, it's not just a new thing. Um, I'm, I'm quite interested in the history of software development and paradigms. If you go back and you go back to the 1970s, when people were talking about a number of these techniques, they're saying, oh, the most important thing here is abstraction. You know, d don't worry about the code inheritance. Well, that's kind of interesting, but don't get distracted by it. It's about abstraction, it's about interfaces, it's about API usage. This is the... Like, and so what did we do? We got distracted by this. People got said, oh, diamond inheritance, reuse, all of this kind of stuff. It turned out that wasn't as important or that wasn't the main show, but we got distracted by it. But since yeah, we, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. I, I was gonna say for sure, like I, when I learned Java at university, there's a lot of stuff about poly, polymorphism and inheritance and reuse and stuff. And as time has gone by, I, I see very little code that really uses inheritance at all. It's like the minute you start reaching for inheritance, certainly in terms of like inheriting from concrete classes or even abstract classes, you're like, probably you shouldn't be here. This is probably not what, this is not how we should be modeling it. We can use interfaces by all means to provide different shapes of the APIs into various things. But as soon as you start using inheritance from, from concrete uh, classes, you're like, don't think we should be here. Don't think we should be doing this. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's, I mean, that's, a, and that's the thing is, is exactly, as you say, although I'd say, actually, I do see a lot of inheritance and almost <laughs> all the inheritance I see worries me. And I find a great concern It's just, it, you know, it, what we need to properly do is brand um, concrete to concrete class inheritance as a code smell. Mm -hmm. um, inheritance from an abstract class that is not further rooted in an interface as a code smell. In other words, the idea is the most valuable thing there is the polymorphism, which goes back to what I said earlier, the pure approach in Java of expressing polymorphism without worrying about all the other noise is use an interface. The interface only exists to say, here is polymorphism. Here is how to use a thing, but how's it built? Don't worry about that. Here is how to use it. It's a pure expression of that. Instead of the way I think a lot of courses still teach it, even now, is they teach interfaces like a poor cousin of abstract classes. No, they're the wealthy cousin. Abstract classes are wandering around with all this baggage and, you know, th this in-betweenness. They don't really, you know, they, they are kind of useful, but they have to fit within an architectural vision. And it's like interfaces. That's that's where you want to start. So I did actually do that a few years ago with a training course. I inverted. I suddenly realized the way that we've been taught inheritance, many languages have promoted it, is upside down. So we started with encapsulation. That's, that's our main point. Okay, keep the data private. Um, present good sensible methods, don't put setters everywhere. Then we introduce into in, interfaces. Then we introduce how you implement an interface. And last, way down the list is, oh, here's inheritance of code. That's right at the end. That really is, a, in other words, you've built everything. So it's, everything has a reason to talk to everything else. 
um, and you, you've got the clear interfaces, you have this understanding of uh, an interface represents a usage. Um, and you can't get more encapsulated than that. You do that. And then you say, sometimes you may share representation. There may be commonality beyond just using. You may say there's common representation. Oh, that's great. Here's the mechanism. But it's the last thing you get taught, not the first thing. You know, and I think that that's, that's something we haven't really addressed industry-wide yet. Right. And the second on in my top is the very popular singleton. You know, I mean, everyone was discussing and I mean, every interview <laughs> had this first question, what's the single tone? I, I yeah, even I, interviewed it. I even interviewed at Google um, not that long ago, and they made me code a singleton using Google Docs as the shared mechanism for I was like, A, I'm not going to use Google Docs for doing IDE type stuff <laughs> and B, <laughs> I can't believe you're making me code a singleton. Like, what year is it? This is ridiculous. <laughs> I did not pass that interview, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you told them, told them things they didn't want to hear. Yeah. I, I remember that, that one of the first pieces of design patterns consultancy I ever had. So I, 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 I was into design patterns relatively early on, but I also saw a number of the issues that people had. They, first of all, they fixated on the Gang of Four book. And then they picked on the wrong patterns. And I remember receiving one day, and this is how far back it was. I received a phone call. It was routed through. Kevin, they're talking about something like design patterns. We have no idea. They seem to want consultancy, or they're not sure if they want consultancy. And so you, your name came up. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to them. I spoke to them, and I said, so, so where are you with design patterns? Well, yeah, we're not sure whether we need consultancy or not, but we've got this singleton collection of singletons, and it's just like, <laughs> yep, you need some consultants. <laughs> yeah, but did you want to do it, or did you just say I'm no, out? <laughs> no, no, it's just like it's just like you need the kind of help I'm not prepared to offer. It's just like you know I'm at a minimum safe distance. Let's keep it that way. Right. I have a nice observation. It seems like we're very in sync with our audience because Florian and I were talking about what subjects to tackle, maybe in what order to have a little uh, story behind it, or leave one to in, into another. And then uh, Daniel is asking, uh, are you also in favor of static fa factories over constructors? So the next one in our minds were minimal constructors by uh, Steve Freeman. So and I can uh, prove that. I mean, it's here on my list. So but I'm a mentalist, I think. I don't know. Hope not. Okay. So should we build up? Yeah. Maybe. So how much, how much uh, stuff do we put in a constructor or? Uh, what do we use instead? Yeah, so I I think this was one of the I think this was one of the articles that I edited, and I can't remember it. <laughs> I think it was one of those ones where Steve when Steve writes stuff, I'm like, yes, I agree with all of that. That's going in the book, absolutely. Um, because it's again, it all comes down to like code smells, doesn't it? Like things like setters, things like having if your constructor takes five thousand items, then especially if you don't have 5,000 fields in your object, you're like, what are, you, what are you doing here? Why are you passing in all of this stuff? What I really liked about this article actually was the fact that he, he gives some examples of code, but he also, um, he, he talks about how to fix these sorts of problems and better ways of, of doing it, like using factory methods um, and um, in, in this particular article. So I've always been, when I saw the question here about static factories over constructors, I've always been a bit like, I don't really care. Like, I don't really have a strong feeling of when you should use one or when you should use another. But um, in this article that, that Steve wrote about, you know, moving towards, if you've got these complicated constructors, then maybe factory methods might fix that problem. That was one of those moments where I was like, oh yeah, I can see how in this particular type of case, this is one of those solutions for those for those types of problems. But often if what you've got is um, some of those objects we were talking about before with like a million fields with a, a, a million uh, a million getters and setters or a million things in your constructor, then your problem is not necessarily using constructors versus factories. Your your problem is you you don't have encapsulation. You have everything. It is God. This is your God class, and it does everything. I think that that's yeah, that's a really good point. Is that sometimes that when we we raise some of these questions, it's not it's not it's rarely about what it's about. It's it's normally it's a pointer to something else. If you've got if you're asking the question about the constructors, actually the real problem is. You, your encapsulation why do you have all of these these billion fields you know I've, I've had people sort of say 
I've got this constructor problem. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I've got these 100 fields. That's not a constructor problem. <laughs> That's definitely that a modeling problem. <laughs> yeah, you, you've got a different problem. But in other words, it, it's where do you realize the problem? And sometimes people realize it at the point of construction. Sometimes people realize it sooner. Sometimes people realize it later. And that there is that that becomes the issue. And, and the thing with, with Steve's article is um, actually, I'm going to pick up on something that Tricia said. Even when um, so Steve's stuff is always worth reading. He's, he's always worth listening to, even when I don't agree with him. <laughs> I find he's always worth listening to because he makes a very clear case and it makes you understand where you are. So uh, it's some of the stuff Steve says in this piece, it's kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, that's exactly where my thinking is. In other cases, it, it's not, but it also makes me wonder, well, why am I not there? Do I have a good reason for not being there? And that actually highlights another theme in the book. We are not just telling, you know, this is not this is not just like here's the 97 this is the way to think it's actually because something like java is it well, something like any language is going to be so diverse and there are so many different experiences of it what you want to do is listen to lots of people present here's here's how i think about this here's how i think about this and you, sometimes you may it may cause you to think understand where you are and sometimes we find that there are cases where there's more than one point of view that makes you know op, an almost an opposite case but the thing that Steve comes through with Steve is that like, it should be a considered choice. You need to think about the initial state. For me, I've always had the idea is however I get my hands on a new object, it should be ready to use. Now, if my constructor doesn't give me an object that is ready to use, then we have a problem if it's public. If it's private, that's not a problem. And I really hope that there's a public static um, uh, available uh, as a factory method. But for me, it's, it's always one of those things of like, when I've given an object, it can't be half baked. It can't be half ready. I can't sit there and say, oh, you need to inject some more. So, no, it, it, give me the thing so that it's, it's ready to use. I open out of the box. I should not have an Ikea furniture experience with every object that I get. It should be done. And that's the point that uh, Steve actually, he really makes very, very clear of like why, when he moves to using factory methods, he is specifically going, saying, you know what, I think the trivial constructor or the trivial constructors are not up to this job, but I want to give you a meaningful object. And actually, I'm going to put the meaning in the name as well. And that's that's really important. And I can't communicate that with constructors. So in some case, so he's making it deliberate. He's making you think about the idea that a constructor is uh, is a deliberate action that preserves encapsulation. Um, but also don't don't give it too much. Don't make it do the whole job of the object. Um, sometimes you want to push that to another method, make it a factory method, and preferably hide that constructor um, uh, from use so that all the, you know, there's only one way to get this, uh, a meaningful object. And I think it's, it's exactly that. Again, it goes back to this idea we, I think we're, we're kind of reaching towards, which is meaning. You know, I want my objects to be meaningful. However I look at them and however I think about them, they should be meaningful. I, I really liked that about this piece as well, that I'd never thought about how the name of the factory method is like, really really valuable so, so in this case it had the thing for international shipment and the thing for local shipment and when i've seen objects where you have two or three different constructors because there are two or three different cases in which you're going to construct that thing i've always found that quite confusing because you're like well are they delegating to each other or are they are they used by different things at different times and in if I'm going to draw a hard and fast line, I would like each thing to only have one constructor for sort of the reasons that we're just talking about. You want to know what's going into it and you don't want to get half-baked objects or you don't want to get objects which, yeah, I just, if you don't want to know, you don't want to have to ask yourself, which constructor do I call in order to create this sort of thing? And so I really like the fact that factory methods are like, this is exactly when you use this factory method and this is the shape of the object it's going to give you. And that idea of the, so sometimes people will jump through hoops to try and overload their constructors. So exactly, you know, so so Steve's got that example for international shipment, um, for local shipment. How might many other developers um, do this? Well, either they're going to overload them on a subtle parameter or they're going to do something like a Boolean and, and, and split it. So when it's true, it does international. and When it's false, it does local. Or is it true, it does local and false, it doesn't. And that leads you down this kind of problem. Whereas the intentionality, again, it's that communication. You see it there and go, oh, this is for international. That's why we've got the bug, because it's a local. You can see it straight there. But true and false or clever piece of overloading doesn't answer that question. Absolutely. 
I mean, Steve is also mentioning uh, dependencies in, in constructor, um, and somehow the well, the, the risk that that this put on on having I mean, obfuscating a little bit the interface to the world, if you're not, not managing this uh, in in the right way. And then there is another topic that Brian Vermeer um, added to, to the to the book regarding to how to handle your dependencies in general and of course it's tackling some specific situations but uh, yeah that's also a very interesting part yeah. um, I, I think this this piece really struck a chord with me because i when this one came along i think i was in the middle of ranting to various people <laughs> I, i'd noticed it with uh, a couple of people about this idea of like yeah i take on all I, we just bring in the dependencies it goes back to that we start with a big stack um and it's just this idea that he makes it again it's a deliberate choice this is architectural your dependencies you can't just say oh yeah we import the universe and uh, and we let maven and gradle handle it it's just like no no these are your decisions there are decisions here and they affect things like security you know if you say well we're not sure well we're using this we don't know what it brings in and it's like well hang on if you're using this dependency and it brings in another dependency you don't know what that is how can you say you know what you know you can make claims about the security of your application or its longevity what's its support model in other words if you don't know what's happening beyond your immediate sphere you know you're drawing in half the universe and sure these tools automatically bring it in but that doesn't mean it's the right thing and it doesn't prevent you from finding surprises um, I mean, certainly bringing in half the universe has a has a deployment cost, but also it has these other business impacts. Security um, uh, is one of the most motivating things these days to manage your dependencies and manage your code quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, I used to work at investment banks in London and uh, every new framework you used, every new library you used had to be vetted you know and approved and at the time i was like i mean whatever because it was a it was a while back and often dependencies would be one or two jar files but they were absolutely right to to sort of set that as a bar of consider what the impact is of, of including this dependency because you know now we know that we pull in a dependency and it pulls in another dependency and it pulls in another and we've heard horror stories about how like you can kind of get your code into millions of places just by being included in something which is included everywhere else so you know there is a security concern and i think as developers we we have fallen into a trap of particularly since using things like maven and gradle like our dependencies are easy as soon as i need something i just stick it in there i don't think about how that impacts the size of my deployable i don't think about how that impacts the 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 surface area of attack for security um i just think about how convenient how convenient it is for me my, my thought on dependencies, given that I worked in some of these types of environments is, uh, like I was saying at the beginning, uh, you, you, you start with like no dependencies and you don't add anything until you absolutely have to because in enterprises in particular, removing a dependency is extremely difficult because you don't really know if you're using it somewhere else, is it used transitively by something else? Am I doing some weird reflection thing so I can't see it in my IDE that it's being used? When I compile it, it doesn't fail, but there might be a runtime error. So removing the dependencies gets really difficult and really hairy. So you want to make sure that you keep the absolute bare minimum to begin with to make your life as, as easy as possible. Yeah, Trisha, all we need is Java. I, I wish that was the case, <laughs> but yeah. Life is more complicated, actually. When, so. when I worked at MongoDB, I was working on the Java driver for MongoDB, and we had a policy of, of no dependencies. Because if we want if we want to be able to get places like banks to use the idea to use the, the database, then the, the driver code needs to be the bare minimum so that they can really see that, that they're only downloading a small amount of code. And it was quite challenging because this is pre, this is around about when Java 8 was coming out. And we wanted to do some like stream stuff or some asynchronous stuff and trying to do that with just Java was, was a bit challenging. Um, but it was the right thing to do because it allows adoption of your technology if you keep your surface area nice and small you keep your driver nice and small and you you keep your your security profile easier to to sort of manage right i've got another favorite if i may and um, then i'm curious which one uh actually i've got two on my list i mean we had, we don't have enough for all the time for all but but actually i've got two so one is technical or non-technical or I, I don't care so it's, it's the diversity in teams 
which will foster innovation and it's proven, right? And the other one is more technical, it's, it's the embrace SQL thinking. The, you know, the, the ORM discussion, the two worlds, uh, object world and relation. I love this. Yeah, I know you like that one. Yeah. I, I would I like to I, I'd like to tackle the, the diversity one and not just because I'm a woman in technology um, because um, Kevin and I worked quite hard to try and get diversity in the book something that Kevin said is that we were trying to get not just diversity in terms of um, you know more women writers and more people of color but diversity of thought we were thinking about like like Kevin said we kind of wanted to show some opposing views where we felt like there's opposing views that are both fairly valid, um, then we would we would try and showcase the two different viewpoints, both of which are valid. And, you know, you know, the answer in software development is always it depends. So you need to show both sides so you can kind of figure out where do you fall in this particular, in your particular project or your particular team. So that kind of diversity of thought was, was quite important for us in the book. Um, in fact, we went out um, and sought out opposite opinions for some of the pieces, didn't we? Because we were like, yeah. yes, we agree with this piece. But we also recognize there is a perfectly valid counter piece to this too. So we want to get all of that in there. And so for me, it's quite important that we we showcase diversity of th thought, diversity of backgrounds, diversity in terms of like, not all the writers in here have been Java developers for 20 years. Some of them come from, um, we sought out uh, pieces from, from the business who work closely with technology. But of course, their viewpoint is different to ours. They don't really care how many lines of code we write or which IDE we use or which version of Java we use. They have a different viewpoint on what are a valuable set of skills for an effective Java developer. And their point of view is is perfectly valid too. So all of this, this kind of like diverse authors and diverse backgrounds, we hope it, it made a book which is which is better it allows you to think more about the types of things that you you haven't thought about before if you just have a no, number of um people who've been doing java development for 20 years always in the same sorts of industry and you sell it to a bunch of java developers who've always been doing things the same way like no one's going to learn anything you know it's just you're just in an echo chamber where you're always constantly talking about the same things and violently agreeing with each other um so diversity is a really important thing and um the particular piece in the in the book was about diverse teams in terms of uh, in terms of gender specifically, I think. Um, but I think there are plenty of studies that show that if you have people from different backgrounds with different experiences, particularly if your product is going to reach a, a broad audience of more than people who are just exactly like you. It's very important that people are on your team thinking about, have you thought about this problem? Have you thought about the way that this might be received in, in this culture or to these types of people? And you will create a more successful product if you have people who represent a, a broader audience working with you on your team. Yeah, I think that that idea, if, if you're all thinking the same, then you're not thinking is one of the kind of like the core, is a starting point um for, for all of this if everybody's the same age the same educational background you know so this is one of those things that i that really I, I guess it bugs me quite a lot these days um uh is that i do see it's very easy for teams to fall into the habit of interviewing people who are like them we have this kind of propagation mechanism it's very human there's nothing unique in software development about it single ton after single ton after single ton after. <laughs> yes exactly we and uh, you know I've, I've seen this in action in a number of places and it's just like it's not that the people are not necessarily intelligent but they're really thinking very narrowly and you've got it it's not that they're clones of one another but they're failing to think in the broader context either of that the business um they're they're not understanding you know they're all they all have a similar um, learning background, which means they're highly specialized, but th all things that are highly specialized fail when the situation they're specialized for um, changes. And we see that with target audiences. We also see that sometimes on interviewing is too narrow. We were talking about, you know, it, 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 Trisha was mentioning, okay, here's this interview with Google. It's like some really narrow, that, that's not a meaningful question. What does it take to be a software developer? It, is is software the you know is software development some artifact of of my chromosomes? Is it an artifact of my skin color? Is it an artifact of of age? Where and it, it feels a little bit strange when we look at it like that and realize that the stuff we're dealing with is um, is the is the highest abstraction of all. 
It's like, clearly that isn't. And we're probably missing out by having everybody thinking narrowly. It's not that these people can't contribute. It's just like, you've got to think broadly. If you're trying to build, you know, it's, it's, it's software is one of some of the craziest stuff that human beings do. And you can't do that with narrow thinking. You need that broad thinking. And we've got to watch out for that kind of particular danger of teams um, falling into groupthink. You know, intellectually, a group of people can be incredibly intelligent. They can also be massively stupid um, if you don't have the right preconditions. You know, in Britain, we call that parliament. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, you know so the, the thing is, you have to get, this goes back to James Surowiecki's book in 2003, The Wisdom of Crowds. And he talks about the subtle difference between a whole load of people all moving in sync versus a, a wise crowd. How do you get a, you know, a team of 12 people to behave in a way that is way more intelligent than 12 individuals, as opposed to sometimes what we see teams do is even though individually expert, they can behave less than the, the 12, the intelligence of that 12 or combined intelligence. And if you're drawing everybody from the same background, you're all making the same assumptions, you've all had the same educational background, you've been in the workforce for the same amount of time, you're not gonna get that large intelligence. You're gonna get something that's a lot smaller. and and that. Again, the research demonstrates this one, and, and it's a little, you know, I think it's a, 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 a you know, point worth making. Either we can do it from a point of view of this is what we believe society should represent. We should also do it if you want to be hard and capitalist about it. That's also a very good reason. It's supported by both points of view. You know, it turns out you're going to get a better product. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. I think we could find like millions of reasons why, of course, a diversity is an asset, it's good to have and so on. But nowadays, since we're speaking quite a lot about, you know, artificial intelligence and, and yeah, the, the, the AI people are saying it loud and clear, we need diversity to remove biases. We need, you know, a variety of things. I mean, otherwise you, you will get just one, two, three big companies doing their thing. Yeah. And that's it. So yeah, I mean, the, the, you the, and the thing is that we don't have to stay within you know the JavaScript for that. When we can look to biology, biology is very very clear about the lessons of uh, uh, of this. Um, you know, it, it's a case of uh, you know don't overfill a niche, but also if you want to think more broadly, and that is the problem is that many software developers are in many ways very removed from the people they are targeting, um, and sometimes that is socially um, uh, they have a very different outlook. Um, and and you know just even, even little things whether it's it's person you know disabilities um, or assumptions I mean we see this every day what what is a person's name <laughs> you know that is you know it, it, just to get a group of developers and say okay I want you to validate names or validate addresses um, <laughs> uh, you will discover very quickly that people have a lot of assumptions that are mostly false yeah and that's just a simple problem we haven't even talked about the hard stuff yet. Um, so that idea is you need to have, a, uh, your, your team needs to be curious, it needs to embody lots of points of view, it can't just be everybody with the same background, um, you know, and the same uh, social background either. And that's what you're trying to do. If you're trying to create one product for one person, and that person is you, there's no problem. But the kinds of product development we're talking about now, particularly the world that we're currently in, where people have discovered in the last 18 months, we've been in a lot harder on our IT systems than we ever meant to. Um, and that's reaching a number of people that were never accounted for. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in those edge cases. There's a huge number. There are millions in those edge cases, whereas previously one or two in the edge cases. But now we've scaled everything up. And that means that's the challenge we as developers, as a development community, also need to meet from our side. It's like, yeah, we're rep we should represent the world. Uh, there should be the world should be seen in us. And I think that's another thing. We, we did fight for this one a little bit. And um, the book cover. The book cover of 97 things, um, every Java program, um, is just like historically the books have included pictures of all the contributors um, if they wanted to be included. And that was something I felt definitely I wanted it. And the publisher wanted to have fewer. And I said, no, 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 we, 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 it's got to be everybody. We're not going to cherry pick, oh, this person, you know, we'll, we'll have this person, but not this person. It's just, no, these, all these people contributed. It's not our book. Um, you know, Tricia and I kind of, you know, <laughs> were the targets, you know, send us your stuff, basically. We made editing decisions, but we did not write the content. And it needs, somebody needs to look at that book cover and go, oh, okay, I can see myself there. These are the people who created this book, and therefore it represents all these points of view. Um, I think that's really important if you have that kind of, um, that, that kind of idea. If you're gonna have photographs, then that's what it represents. So that for me was actually quite um, symbolically quite important. 
By the way, it, it's really amazing what you've done by putting together this community thinking and, all, I mean, yeah, it's brilliant. But maybe for one last time, a bit selfish and last my one curiosity <laughs> about embracing the SQL thinking in an object-oriented world. Not anymore. This is what I learned at last code camp. So OOP is deprecated. <laughs> I, I'm learning a lot of things, you know, in, in this uh, yeah, world. Well, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it's kind of funny. It's it, it's 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 funny uh, you mentioned it because actually on 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 Monday I'm doing um, I'm doing I, and I've actually done it for I've done it for uh, CoCam before. I've done a one day on multi multiple paradigms, and for me, you know, a, a paradigm is a point of view. It's a way of thinking, and a language like Java it has a bias in a particular style of thinking, but that's not the only way to think. Um, importantly, and you know, it's not just Java eight that opened things up, but Java eight certainly made it explicit, hey, guess what? There's one way, more than one way to approach a problem. And for me, a paradigm is a way of looking at a thing and saying, from this point of view, this problem looks a lot easier. From that point of view, it might look a bit harder. And and it, it, it's, it shows you different styles of thinking. And that for me is really important. And what Dean has done in Embrace SQL Thinking is he's encouraging this idea that in SQL, SQL is a, actually logic programming at its heart. It's a declarative way of looking at things rather than an imperative way of looking at things. Um, and although we might get, you know, people might curse their database and curse the quirks of SQL, that's, he's, that's not the bit he's trying to get you to embrace. He's trying to get you to embrace the idea that, you know, maybe we don't need, maybe life doesn't have to be for loops, within <laughs> for loops, you know? I'm actually, um, I'm, I'm currently helping to write the, the, the new version of Head First Java, um, Head First Java 3rd edition, and I'm, I'm trying to work on lambdas and streams right now. And the this trying to teach streams to new developers. Previously, I've taught the stream stuff to existing Java developers, and you kind of just give them the diff between where they were and, and where they're going to be. Um, but now I'm trying to think about how to teach the streams API to, to new developers. And it, to me, I keep thinking about SQL as, as a similar type of thing, because, I mean, it sounds like it's very easy to get streams confused with reactive streams and they're not the same thing at all. You think about streaming data and it's actually not really the same thing. The, the the way that you can work with streams in with Java 8 with your data sets is much more similar to, to SQL. You're going to do a filter, you're going to extract the fields that you want and you're going to perhaps put distinct on it and sort it in a particular way. So if you can kind of get your head around, like you said, and you're not going to loop, you're not going to put an if statement in there, you're not going to tell it how to do stuff, you're going to tell it this is the shape of the data I want. Just just give it to me. Um, this is my query. Give it to me in the shape I want. I can have it in a list or account or whatever. And it is a bit of a different way of thinking in terms of compared to the rest of the book, which is all if statements and for loops and, and stuff like that. And you go, right, forget all of that. <laughs> now let's think in a tell me, t tell the compiler what you want and not how to do it. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a mental, I'm, I'm really struggling. I'm writing this, I've been literally writing this chapter like over this week and i'm really struggling with it but i bet i bet i mean the thing is and that's one of the things about writing isn't it when you when you are forced into a frame of something that's become second nature to you when you start articulating it you're going to end up understanding it you're going to come out of this knowing way more about streams you know you've, you've done streams for like the last seven years but you're going to come out of it knowing even more than you went into it i think that's really important again it's that idea that you know, a paradigm is a point of view. It's when you, you're, you're literally trying to teach somebody a way of thinking, a way of looking at a problem, a way of shaping the world and understanding that they have more than one choice. As you said, uh, yeah, it depends. And it's exactly that, it does. But what we've got to do is show people, it depends on this, it depends on this, if right. you can, yeah. and then show them that, you know, and that can be very daunting as, as a beginner, but it's also incredibly valuable when you do realize it's just, oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not locked into one way of thinking, but also it's a different way of thinking. And that may make your, that may make certain things easier in the long run. It just gives you a different mental model. And I think that that's the bit we often, we often start from syntax, but I think we undervalue the, the amount that it, this is actually the bit that, you know, it's just, oh, it's a different point of view. And it's just like, right, that's, that's what, you know, I'm learning to think differently rather than just, hey, it's a neat syntax. And that's, that's, I think, the, 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 the greatest strength of this. And hence, the Embrace SQL um, 
you embrace that idea of sequel thinking is is a really powerful i mean it goes beyond that i mean there's lots of different styles of thinking but dean has been very specific here just to show us something concrete um and that is it, it gets people looking at something that can become very very conventional you know in a world of for loops tell people you've probably written i mean it's one of those things i sometimes tell people have you not written enough loops in your life you've probably written every loop you ever everything you write from now on is going to be like all the loops you've ever written you're never going to write a new kind of loop surely if you're an experienced developer and um, so wouldn't it be nice to think you know you know what what is that i'm actually trying to do with this loop rather than here is another loop absolutely so i just realized that uh, we're like well, 60 minutes after we started i mean when did, did this happen uh, ben and we've been totally selfish i mean we we had all the questions so we, we i mean discussed all our favorites so what are your favorites from the book <laughs> sorry that after 60 minutes <laughs> we are writing this <laughs> but i i liked loads of them <laughs> I yeah. can't remember. I <coughs> excuse me. I've got a cold, and this cough is not going away. Um, I really, I actually liked the Kotlin pieces because I worked for JetBrains. JetBrains invented Kotlin, but I don't know anything about Kotlin. So I really wanted to, um, to particularly the, the Kotlin coroutines piece because. I don't know anything about coroutines. I don't understand what they are. I don't know how they work. And every time someone tries to tell me, I just, I'm like, I don't get it. I don't understand. But the, the piece about Kotlin coroutines in this, I was like, oh, it's it's not that hard. That looks cool. We should have that in Java. So that was another one of those things where it helped plug a, a hole in my knowledge, but also um, because I've been doing Java since 1997 and I've done some other languages, but really, nothing obviously nothing anywhere near as in depth as, as i've been doing the java so again in terms of diversity and, and different paradigms and different ways of thinking um i really enjoyed reading some of that stuff to be like um okay actually i think we might be missing something in java i wonder how we could either get it in java or how could i mimic that or use it in a, in a different way or I mean, Java and Kotlin are completely interoperable, so fine. I'm just going to use Kotlin for those times when I want to do this particular shape of thing. So yeah, I found I found the Kotlin ones quite interesting. Well, Thank how you. about you, Kevin? Oh, I'm not going to play favorites. I, I'm going <laughs> yeah. to go with Trisha's opening answer. I like oh, lots of them, you know. uh, but I'm not going to play favorites. But you know, it, it's it, it's. You know, it was just, it was an enjoy, you know, and that, I think the, fu the funny thing is that both Trisha and I also have things that we liked that weren't included in the book. That was a hard, that was a hard, you know, there's a magic number, 97, we've got to, got to do that. And it's, and, and there was a very important point to try and get as many points of view represented as possible. And also to not over-represent an individual. Some people contributed many, many items. And even though they had some killer pieces, it's just like, that this isn't there, you know, we've got to put a limit. We put a limit of three on anybody. Jean, no Jean, more had, than three. Jean had six and they were, yes. all oh, they were all good. I wanted to put them all in. Yeah, it was hard to, you know, so there were some hard decisions that had to be made. And it is, it, so there are things that weren't included that we really liked. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, that's, I'm definitely not going to play okay, favorites because I think it's too I, difficult. I, I, I didn't want, I didn't want to play the, you know, the, uh, you know, the favorite game that I'm, I'm my favorite game with, with them, you know, you know, there is a show in the, in the UK or in the States, I don't know, the late, late night show. There is that very popular guy who invites celebrities and asks questions. They've got very good food on their table. I'm not this <laughs> Very good food on the table. I mean, strange things for, for you know, and they ask something like in, spit or <laughs> saliva, <laughs> and they are asking impossible questions. And you have the option to answer the question or to taste, uh, you know, some of the delicious food that, that this is isn't going to work, is it? Because we're in different places. Here we go Bitcoin. Genuine oh, Bitcoin. There you go. Wow. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I think I don't know if the chocolate. Uh, the chocolate's probably, you know, probably is substantial. Probably volatile. I mean, <laughs> probably half of it will be gone by tomorrow morning, or I'll end up with a whole table full of this. But I do. I do agree with you that it was. It's really hard picking something, saying, "Yeah, this is better than the other," or "I like this more." Everybody, everything uh, is really interesting, and then it uh, makes you think of different things. It brings you back to old projects. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do exactly because the point is, if I told you one, 
the minute we finish, I'll think, oh, no, I should have said this. <laughs> so, I, so I'm going to do exactly. And unfortunately, this is a character trait of mine. My, my wife learned this years ago. You know, sitting there in the pub on Friday, she said, Kevlin, what's your favorite movie? And I give her my top five. If she asks me, what are your top five favorite movies? I give her my top 10. You know, it's just one of those things of like, I'm not going to overcommit where, 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 where that opportunity exists. You know? so, so that's how we got to 97. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was originally supposed to be three, but. You know. <laughs> we did, whenever we, whenever we interview about the book, we usually, we pick different things every time, don't we? We, yeah. we pick different ones to focus on. And, and, and that's, that's the great thing. I mean, that's why it's ordered alphabetically, isn't it? Because there's no yeah. way, there's no other way to order them, to group them to prioritize them like like you were saying at the beginning just open the book and read something you know randomly yeah. you'll learn something yeah well that's I, why I, with right to help with right to do most of the picking <laughs> yes. yes well no th that's great because i think that's that's much more value because uh, is that is trisha's test because I, I the funny thing is in the you know it's been a, it's been over a year since the book was published and so you know a couple of years since we started editing it and the, the funny thing is that every time I go back, I have a slightly different preference. Every, I sometimes pick it up and I go, oh, I forgot about this one. I forgot how much I really liked this piece. Um, or it, it, a particular piece will catch me at just the right point because perhaps I've been focused on something in the last week that is incredibly relevant. And maybe I, did, I wasn't in that frame of mind when I originally read it and I saw its value, but now it means even more to me than it did when I first edited it. So there's a kind of constantly changing um uh, element to that but yeah different ones kind of pop up over time as being oh this is relevant to me this week or this is my favorite this week books i mean i think we're 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 come kind of close to the the end of our session but um would you please recommend us your favorite book right now or your nothing up. 97 things every job a programmer should know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty the sure the other one the other book uh, I think head first head first head first head first 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 <laughs> yeah I think that's going to be a, that's going to be a winner I'm, I'm pretty sure that you might have an opinion on that I someone was asking when is that coming out uh is that you can actually pre-order it at the moment on Amazon um it looks like the middle of next year I mean I'm still writing it so it's going to be a while <laughs> But it, yeah, middle of next year, maybe. Brilliant. Brilliant. What right. I mostly, mostly, mostly Kevlin and I are into like science fiction and novels, right? Like not, <laughs> not other stuff. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to continue. I mean, we were thinking, should we extend it? I don't know about your time. I don't know about your uh, our audience time. We, we definitely have uh, time for that. Yeah, I think we could speak about this uh, all day. But uh, let's, uh, let's do a sequel. Uh, I mean, with Kevlin, we're used to doing trilogies now nowadays. Yeah, that was, a, that was an interesting one. We ended up with an accidental trilogy of talks. But yeah, there we go. The accidental trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> I can definitely try one here. There are plenty of topics. Yeah. Well, it, obviously, you know, invite us back next year, and we'll give you, you know, we'll pick on we'll pick on a, a, a different bunch, and you can ask us different questions, and maybe we, maybe the answers to them, some of them will be the same. <laughs> And maybe we'll have changed our minds completely about some of the things. Yeah, but like, you don't know this stupid. At this point. We shouldn't do that trace. Yeah, yes. God, we came up with that idea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we should do it just to test it, if not for anything else. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's how you test the consistency of a system. Yeah. Yes. So I was curious: Are you done with the conferences for this year, or there's still? I'm not. I'm not doing any more conferences. Me personally. I, uh, bizarrely, I, I know I, that I for sure because we tried to get the uh, three shine code camp. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just, I, I got a bit, uh, I, I kind of, I really liked virtual conferences to begin with because I'm like, great, I don't have to travel anywhere. But now I'm just like, oh my goodness, it's, it's kind of, when you travel somewhere, that's great. You're kind of excited, you're prepped for it. You're going to take three days off your normal day job. You're going to meet people and you're going to have fun. Um, but then when you're doing virtual conferences, you stop what you're doing work-wise, like five minutes before your talk, you give your talk, and then you go back to work and it's just it's really like oh and you don't get to meet anyone you don't get to hear anything from anyone i mean obviously we've has, had a nice chat today with people talking to us but quite often you don't really get that much of a, of a connection with people and and i'm like i, I think i'm going to take a bit of a break from this because it's just yeah. it's exhausting and, and it's not very it's not as satisfying as going and meeting people in real life yeah and, and i've yeah. had that i mean I've, I've ended up bizarrely enough going to um four in the real conferences plus one other event um in the real world um 
and uh, over the last few months so basically by the end of the year i've got one more to do after after where i am now i was in uh, copenhagen last week um, Vilnius this week and then in two weeks time assuming the partial lockdown is lifted in Amsterdam I had not planned my my plan was to just do one or two if I could depending on conditions I was expecting most of them to cancel because most of them have in the past cancelled or proven difficult to get to but suddenly it, it, a few things have opened up at the same time and I have been reminded of both how exhausting but also how much fun a real world conference can be and, and actually being somewhere um, uh, but also the disruption it also causes other disruptions you do have to take those days off from your regular work um, um, and I've got used to slicing everything into my days um, in a very different way um, and so yeah I, I have to agree with Trisha that I'm, I'm not doing I think, I think I might have one more virtual conference this year but I, even that might be one uh, that might actually be zero I can't remember I'm just trying to do this from memory um, because uh, I'm trying to reduce my inv involvement there because I found that I am struggling to remember each conference because mm -hmm. when you have a sense of place it turns out the human mind our system of memory everything about our, our sense uh, our set of senses I am finding it harder to distinguish things which makes it really difficult it's like didn't I do this slide I'm sure I did a talk last year where was I oh yes my office Yes. <laughs> like I always at home, yeah. where I always am, right next to the coffee machine. In other words, whereas normally you can kind of mentally think, "Oh yeah, yeah, that was in this hall," or "Oh, I remember, I remember who I spoke to after that talk." And so it turns out that that's how we anchor things. Is not necessarily by what we were doing, but by everything that was around what we were doing. And I find I can't. Initially, I thought, "Oh, this is just me getting old. I can't remember things." And I said, "Well, isn't it coincidence? It's all coincided we're, with me." We're laughing here because, because uh, we were trying to count how many conferences did we do uh, this year. I, I think it was like ten or twelve, but I don't know for sure right now because yeah, exactly was, because you were always in the same place. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 So I, I think I've, I've got like, I don't know, I, I love this wall now. It's, um... <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, you know, I think I mean, I've got used to seeing you, you guys in front of that wall. You know, I don't, I mean, if you put a different background on, I go, who are you? You know, just, <laughs> I mean, it went, you know, it's just like, and you know, oh, this isn't co-camp Romania anymore. This is just like somebody else, you know, it's a, so yeah, you have, it's literally become part of the furniture, part of the fabric of the space. <laughs> Absolutely. I was very confused by you being in a hotel room, Kevlin. I'm like, where are you? That's yeah, weird. I, so, I know. I, I I have to say, I'm I feel it quite weird because I'm looking, I'm seeing this image. It's just like this is really unfamiliar. This doesn't look at all like my office. Um, that's because it's not. So so yeah, I've got a slightly different sound setup as well. But but yeah, it is it it's quite unusual. Um, but. Uh, yeah, more, I, I'd like to have more unusual. Yeah, looking forward to that. I mean, I can't wait, you know, next year when hopefully we'll meet again in person, right? That's the plan. Absolutely. So, are we? Yeah, I think... Uh, I'm sad now. It's that time to be melancholic. But, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the talk. So, thank you a lot, Trisha and Kevin, for this. Really appreciate it. Yeah, very, very good time, you know, together. And, and I, I bet the community loved that. I mean, yeah. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much for watching us. And thank you for all These your These are real applauses, right? <laughs> okay. See you so next year. Have a good time. Christmas. Thank you so much. Yeah, Merry thank Christmas. You, you too. And yeah, see you next time. And uh, everybody out there, thanks a lot for joining. Like Florian said, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Mambu, for making this happen. And stay tuned because uh, the year is still young for us. We've got two more conferences, the one before Sennik and the one Well, the one Christmas. after Sennik and before Christmas, but you're close. Yeah, two more conferences. Yeah. Yay. See you next time, everyone. See you. Bye. Bye-bye.